In order to prepare for war, the United States had to undertake a massive mobilization effort. World War I was a total war, which meant that the entire population would be involved somehow in the effort to build the armed forces, mobilize the economy, conserve food and fuel, raise money, and build public support. When the war broke out, the U.S. Army was small compared to that of Germany. We had roughly 300,000 troops compared to Germany's 3.8 million. Although many men volunteered, many felt that a military draft would be necessary. In 1917, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, which required all men between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for the draft. Eventually, about 2.8 million Americans were drafted. In addition to those drafted, approximately 2 million volunteered. American women also joined the armed forces as nurses and clerical personnel. 400,000 African Americans were also drafted, 42,000 of them fought in Europe. To equip the armed forces, the federal government had to mobilize its industry and workforce and take control of large sectors of the American economy. The War Industries Board was created in order to coordinate the production of war materials. In order to prevent labor strikes that could cripple production, the National War Labor Board was established. The NWLB worked to resolve any labor disputes before they turned into a strike. The Railroad Commission was established as the federal government nationalized or took control of the nation's railroads. In order to fill the void left when so many men joined the armed forces, over one million American women joined the workforce. The need for industrial workers had a positive effect on another group of Americans. During what was called the Great Migration, 300 to 500,000 African Americans left the South and resettled in northern cities such as New York, Detroit, St. Louis, and Chicago. They were attracted by the opportunity of higher paying industrial jobs and a chance to leave the Jim Crow segregated South. Anticipating shortages of food and fuel, the federal government encouraged citizens to conserve as much as possible. Future President Herbert Hoover was put in charge of the newly created Food Administration. The Food Administration was in charge of preventing any wartime hoarding of food and tried to keep food prices stable. In addition to feeding itself, the United States also had to feed its starving allies in Europe. The Food Administration encouraged people to grow their own food in what were known as Liberty Gardens. Also, the government campaigned for people to voluntarily ration their consumption. A good patriotic American would follow Wheatless Mondays or Meatless Tuesdays and save their cooking grease so it could be used in armament factories. The government also created the Fuel Administration, which pushed for the implementation of daylight saving times in order to use less fuel. The government had to find a way to pay for the war. In addition to raising taxes by passing the War Revenues Act, Congress also passed the Liberty Loan Act, which authorized the sale of war bonds to the American public. Bonds would be paid back with interest. In total, the government raised about $32 billion to fund the war. None of the mobilization efforts would have been possible had the American public not supported the war effort. To help build public support for the war, Woodrow Wilson created the Committee on Public Information. Journalist George Creel was chosen to head the agency, whose job it was to sell the war to the American public. Creel recruited advertising executives, entertainers, and artists to create propaganda posters and pamphlets, as well as toured the country encouraging Americans to enlist, conserve, or buy war bonds. The effort to shape public opinion also led to debates about free speech and the First Amendment.